before we finish up on HER2, let's just talk a little bit about uh, a little, uh, some other kind of uh, small molecules that are uh, being explored uh, for anti-HER2 new. Uh, one of them, obviously, is something that's been explored for a number of years and actually has approval, uh, which is lapatinib. Um, actually, uh, there is a phase three study that's going to be presented uh, at this year's uh, San Antonio meeting, long-term follow-up uh, of the NEO-ALTO trial. Uh, there also uh, is NSAVP B41, which is a trial of dual HER2 blockade and HER2 positive breast cancer, uh, which was presented at uh, um, ASCO. In this particular trial, uh, patients received neoadjuvant lapatinib or trastuzumab alone or in combination uh, after doxorubin cyclophosphamide therapy. In total, the targeted therapy was completed by protocol uh, in 82% of the patients in the trastuzumab arm uh, alone and in the lapatinib arms of the trial. Uh, either in combination or alone 66% of the time. Um, after uh, discontinuing study therapy, 4% of the lapatinib group crossed over to trastuzumab. Uh, there was actually, interesting no difference uh, in the treatment groups in the percentage of women who received a PCR, 52% uh, with trastuzumab, 53% with lapatinib, uh, and 62% with the combination. Uh, while numerically superior, the p-value was not, sig not significant. Um, and um, interestingly enough, when you substitute lapatinib for trastuzumab, uh, uh, these are similar uh, high rates of pathologic complete response. Um, interestingly, uh, again, the NEO-ALTA trial uh, did show a significant benefit to the combination. Um, it'll be interesting to hear the panelists' um, views. We're going to get, again, some of the longer-term survival data uh, at the San Antonio meeting this year. Uh, but I'm curious, uh, and I think I have some ideas why, uh, B41 uh, was less positive uh, than uh, Neoalto. It's also good to just keep in mind another data set. Lisa Carey presented CLGB40601 okay. at ASCO this year also, mm -hmm. uh, which was a similar study, but looked at a lapatinib, trastuzumab, or the combination. Now, uh, after the futility uh, threshold was reached in the ALTO trial and the lapatinib alone arm was closed, these trials also tended to get rid of their lapatinib-only arms, and they were very hard to tolerate, and people did cross over to receive trastuzumab just because of intolerance. But yeah, Lisa also showed a better pathologic CR rate with the combination than the uh, single-agent trastuzumab, or, and the lapatinib arm was closed earlier. So I think that uh, this is stands alone, and it, it was a little bit different because these patients got... Uh, you know, we're not looking at outcome yet until this meeting with these trials, and uh, these patients also got anthracycline um, in up front, and I think that may have changed what we're seeing in terms of the differences in path CR. And maybe it'll mean that we won't see the differences in outcome in Alto. You know, I want, yeah, I wanted to just uh, amplify what Hope said, too, because there was, um, we in U.S. Oncology did a pre similar preoperative study to this trastuzumab, lapatinib versus both, and then there was the Churlobe study, and all, all of those showed, except for the NSABP B41, right. showed an improvement in PAF-CR rate. You know, it's interesting, though, I have a, I have a poster here at uh, San Antonio on um, three inflammatory breast cancer patients, ER negative, HER2 positive, who were primary refractory to trastuzumab, who went on to have partial responses in their, in their breast by the time they went to surgery, but at least they were responding, you know. I and mean, I just added the lapatinib on to the trastuzumab at that time some years ago. Um, and these patients still had a lot of disease. They were on the chest wall, some big disease, okay? So, you know, um, these particular patients have remained NED, and so I have a, some biomarker on that. So the question I'm raising will be very interesting to see the neoadjuvant uh, long-term data on the neoalto is that um, lapatinib is anti-proliferative. And though we know that the PAP-CR rates, if you get one, that's great, it may still be that even if you don't get one, you still, there still may be some benefit there for, for patients. So it's a very interesting agent that I think really does have legs in breast cancer. The question is going to be trying to figure out um, who really benefits um, from it. It's so interesting because I have a patient very similar whose disease actually grew on... Uh, it, it shrunk on doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide. Then she had her baby. She was pregnant. And then it grew. She grew a whole new tumor that was HER2 positive, ER negative, while on paclitaxel trastuzumab, very bad, and uh, with skin involvement, new, in a new quadrant of her breast, nine centimeters. So she went to surgery. And two weeks after surgery, she had a skin nodule again that was tumor. So I gave her lapatinib trastuzumab 
and uh, she got radiation and Zalota for a while, Cape Cytobine for a while. And uh, she's still on lapatinib and trastuzumab, I haven't stopped it yet, at two years. So this was really bad disease. And it makes me think of the data that we uh, participated in for a trial that Kim uh, published, looking at the combination of lapatinib and trastuzumab and seeing the survival benefit, which you know was hard to put to the FDA, but is still, I think, quite interesting in the ability to overcome some type of resistance. I mean, so that's, that, that brings the question, is there a future for lapatinib, in a, especially in the metastatic setting, where clearly lapatinib and capecitabine is inferior to TDM1? Um, we now have the Cerebell trial from last year, where brain metastases was looked at. It had to be stopped early because the trastuzumab arms of the trial were superior in terms of systemic response. Uh, the, uh, I think, MA31 trial was MA32, Mm -hmm. um, from Canada, which was a first-line comparison of paclitaxel lapatinib to paclitaxel um, uh, trastuzumab, which also had to be stopped mm -hmm. early. Um, and now we have uh, neoadjuvant therapy. That's a pretty bad combination. It it's is, but now we have neoadjuvant therapy <laughs> with pertuzumab, trastuzumab up front. And so the question is, is there a future for lapatinib? I'll start with Kim, right. who actually has, I think, you know, PI'd one of the nicer trials of the combination in metastatic disease, I think a lot of us use. Well, I mean, I think the take home, points, take home points are that lapatinib is inferior to trastuzumab in the metastatic setting. And that, that should be, I think that's been proven now in a, at least three studies to my knowledge. So, and for patients who for some reason cannot tolerate trastuzumab, which are few and far between, then lapatinib would be a choice, but it's not based on efficacy. So where would we use lapatinib? Well, we know that TDM1 is superior to lapatinib, but that doesn't mean that lapatinib doesn't have efficacy in patients who have progressed on TDM1 and pertuzumab-based regimen. So I'll continue to think about lapatinib in that setting. I think NeoAlto uh, is very similar to pertuzumab. really says that we can add another HER2 agent in the neoadjuvant setting, and it improves outcome, at least PCR. There's a consistency in that data. So. Um, I'm not using a lot of lapatinib in the neoadjuvant setting, but when we know the updated and prolonged results of neoalto, I might, and certainly when alto comes out, we might. And then in the metastatic setting, the combination of lapatinib and trastuzumab for patients having progressed on trastuzumab was recently approved in Europe yeah. um, mm -hmm. as superior to lapatinib alone. So there is a role. It's not in the first line setting. It's not in a second line setting. I, I don't think it's as a substitute, an oral substitute for TRAS, which is how we used to think about it. Um, but I do think it is an option that um, has some proven efficacy and should be considered after patients have had TDM1 and pertuzumab in the metastatic setting. So and I think a lot of us feel, and I'm curious to see what other people have to say, that one of the reasons the head-to-head -head comparisons were not as successful as they could have been uh, for lapatinib was because of the toxicity of the drug and being able to deliver it. And Joyce, do you have any uh, comments about what toxicities you've seen with lapatinib at the standard dosing that the FDA label says? Yes, and the um, uh, combination, you know, the Kim, Kim pioneered with the trastuzumab, it's four pills of, of lapatinib, it's the 1,000, because you really get into diarrhea issues with the combination. Um, and you also get into significant diarrhea issues with capecitabine, which is an important option for our patients with brain metastasis. And I think I, I try to remember to try to go ahead with the capecitabine and lapatinib before whole brain radiation therapy based on the landscape trial in patients that you can have that luxury, you know, to have a window of time because the patients really had a longer period of benefit, you know, before they had whole brain radiation. But um, I think, though, uh, that um, I have these patients, and these patients I have here have been on, a lapatinib five plus years, and they're taking the 1250, one with trastuzumab, um, two without, and they have the occasional loose stool, not bad. I think there is some tachyphylaxis to it over time, you know, but I think um, an aggressive use of um, anti-diarrheal agents up, up front with the appropriate um, uh, holidays, you know, to stop and allow people to, to recover. But, um, you know, it, I think we've had a lot of experience with the uh, the Cape side, I mean, at the end, without and with the lapatinib management of toxicities, but um, it's it's workable. It's workable for the for the patients who really need those agents. Any other comments from 
Other panel members? Yeah, it's interesting. Oh. I, I, I like the capecitabine effect on the brain metastases, but I've kind of switched over to using trastuzumab capecitabine when I use that combination just because it's so much easier to give. And then I can give lapatinib with trastuzumab, which is easier to give. So then I don't have to worry about the more significant toxicity of those two drugs, because I don't think anybody's ever shown that those two drugs together are necessarily so great for brain mets. I think both lapatinib and capecitabine can cross the blood-brain barrier and result in improvement in brain metastases in a select number of patients. I think the reason why people get bad toxicity, and similarly, but more so with neratinib, is pharmacogenomics. Some people are susceptible to the drug and metabolize it differently, and the way to manage neuratinib toxicity seems to be giving a whole lot of antidiarrheal therapy continuously. And uh, people then can take the drug, whether they're happy remains to be seen. Well, that's a good, I mean, the patients need to be happy, especially yeah. someone on a chronic a regimen for a long time. <laughs> yes. You know, they'll say they'll take it, but they really won't. You know, that's the problem. Um, back to the brain meds issue, there, there is about to be a, a dose escalation of trastuzumab trial in patients with HER2 positive brain metastases. So that'll be very interesting to see whether by mass action you can uh, increase access to the tumor uh, across the uh, blood brain. There barrier. actually is also consideration of TDM1 for that same purpose. Oh, yeah. right. So huh. by you know, being incorporated into the lysosome and potentially going through some sort of, I didn't know how it would work, the mechanism, but to be honest with you, somehow getting through the blood-brain barrier. That's interesting, because yeah. that's one of the things we saw in the phase two, is people would get progression in brain and not systemically. Yeah. So we changed the trial over time to keep those patients on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it didn't seem to me to be the greatest thing for uh, brain mets. But it, people are also testing intrathecal trastuzumab, which is an intriguing idea. You have to be good at poking mm -hmm. this that was a, spinal we, fluid. I mean, I don't know other people's experience. We tried we try to get approval for that, get the drug. Uh, from the sponsor. Uh, this is probably seven or eight years ago. And there was one case report um, of someone who had leptomeningeal disease. And apparently there's a, a, it's bound to tree halos, a sugar, and you had to get the trastuzumab without the tree halos to give it. And Genentech at the time wouldn't give us the They had the There's IT a study going on out of Chicago uh, that my colleague is participating in that will give intrathecal trastuzumab for leptomeningeal disease. So. That's great. I think yeah. a little trial. Idea. Yeah, I, I'd say at, at this year's San Antonio also, the Amelia data, although it's not a huge um, subset, looked at patients who went on the trial with treated brain mets and also progression with them. And there doesn't seem to be a lack of efficacy either way. It looks really? though Gosh. people don't do um, any better, nor do they do any worse between lapatinib, capecitabine, and TDM1. Again, with the caveat, it's a small subset. So I think the reality is I would 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 not use I would use TDM1 in patients with brain metastases because it had proven efficacy benefits over lapatinib and capecitabine. I wouldn't let the brain met thing be the differentiating factor if you have a patient who would have been eligible for Amelia meets those criteria and has brain mats, I still think that TDM1 has proven efficacy over lapatinib and cave. I don't let the brain mats drive my decision making in that patient population.